Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays. My name is Francesca D'Alessio, and I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Tonight, we are so excited to host Catherine Wagner. For over 30 years, Bay Area artist Catherine Wagner has observed the built environment as a metaphor for how we construct our cultural identities. Tonight's program is in conjunction with our podcast series, Local Voices, designed to celebrate art and Bay Area creativity. This season, we explore public art and monuments, transforming landscapes, building our collective memory, and revealing distinctive characteristics of our city. Through seven episodes, we explore the ways in which public art sparks dialogue and promotes creative expression as a tool for social change. Tonight, Catherine shares with us her public art practice. Please give a warm welcome to Catherine Wagner. So hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to do a talk with the De Young Museum today. And the name of this talk is called An Expanded Practice, Photographs, Periscopes, and Granite Walls. And what I'm going to show you in the next uh, 45 minutes is how I've used the medium of photography, both in both a traditional way and in an expanded practice way where I've started working outside of the gallery, outside of the museum, and really um, finding a synthesis with how these photographs can become a part of architecture. And let's, let's take a look here. So I'm, I'm going back to early work from the Moscone site, which most of you who are in San Francisco know, it was the large construction site uh, south of Market that then was developed into a, a convention center. And it really claimed, um, it claimed to be the largest construction site south of the Mississippi or west of the Mississippi. And it also became a place where South of Market became the cultural center of San Francisco. And I was drawn to working on this site, not, not because of the architecture per se, but that I was, using, I was using the construction site as a metaphor to talk about ideas of change and change being something that's um, a part of all our lives. So I was fascinated by this, this very large hole in the ground, which was near my studio in the late 70s. And I checked on, on, this, on this progress daily, ended up uh, working with the construction. I think um, I shouldn't say who it was, but they ended up giving me uh, permission to be in this site as long as I wore a hard hat and an orange vest. And I came in every weekend for a period of six years. So I really, I, I wasn't trying to document the progression, but I was really trying to work metaphorically with an idea that I still work with today. And that idea is something I call archeology span in reverse. And in many ways, I thought about these photographs in terms of the notion of future ruins. And even though this work is maybe 35 years old now, it's still, it still comes forward to me in terms of my conceptual thinking and it, it has, um, taken, it has become the foundation for other works of art. So in this photograph that I'm going to show you is Museum Station. Uh, and Museum Station is one of the um, central, subway, uh, central subway stations that will be open probably in about a year from now. It was supposed to open four years ago. Uh, it's a public art project. It's a federal project. And this will be the first central subway station that you can get on at, um, you can get on at the train station and then you'll stop at what they call museum station or Yerba Buena station or Moscone station. It will then go on to Union Square and then from Union Square to Chinatown and ultimately will go on all the way to the Bay to Fisherman's Wharf. And I thought that this would be a really, an, um, a really important place for me to work with these photographs that I made 30 plus years ahead of time in the exact same place where those photographs were conceived of. So I developed a process um, with, an, with a, 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 laser, a laser masonry expert, Rex Zylash, who we worked for years on developing these large granite slabs so that these large granite slabs would emulate the photographs. And here you're just seeing an architectural rendering, a schematic of how, how these will look in the central subway. It is completely installed and it was installed prior to the pandemic, but 
It can't be seen by the public yet because there's been no official opening, but this gives you a really good sense, I think, of what happens when you uh, get off the subway car, come up the escalator, and then there's a, um, a gallery, if you will, of like 15 foot granite slabs with the same photographs that I made from the Moscone site in the late 70s, early 80s. This is some um, when we were doing some R and D uh, at the at the um, laser etching masonry studio I was working at, and so you can see this is just like you can see these are these granite slabs and we're piecing them together, and I was just incredibly delighted when we were able to achieve the um, the resolution and the quality on granite because I thought oh God is this is this is this is not going to be photographic because I really wanted them to maintain that that um, kind of photographic integrity. So this I'm showing you an in process um, photograph of when we were actually working at the studio, the masonry studio where we were laser etching and we were ass assembling these granite slabs together to form this monumental panel, a, gran a monumental granite panel. And now you're just seeing it from another view. And I, we had, in order for me to kind of look at it and, and be able to kind of assess if, if, if the quality of it was right, I'd have to get on like a 17 foot ladder and look down because ultimately we were gonna be seeing it plumb to a wall, but we couldn't do that in the studio. And now this is actually a kind of an iPhone snap of the beginning of installing these in the central subway, which is why you're seeing it still being a construction site. When the station is open, before, before you get into the bowels of the subway, you'll be walking along um, Folsom. You'll be walking along Folsom and 4th Street, 3rd or 4th Street, and you'll see uh, the station entrance, Yerba Buena Moscone Station. And there will be a 50 foot piece of laser etched glass. And I've done it so that um, I'm not using uh, we just rubbed a little bit of white in the etch itself. And so it looks very kind of ghost-like. And it's a ghost image, if you will, of exactly what was there before this um, station, station came to be. So in many ways, I'm kind of playing with this ghosting of history, working with new materials in the public realm. Here I'm working with like large um, glass slabs. And in the station itself, I'm working with large granite slabs. So now I'm taking you into like, how did I first, um, how did I first start moving photographs into, into a different way of looking at them? And I was asked to do an exhibition at LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art in, I think in the early, um, I can't remember, the late eighties, late eighties, early nineties. And I had been working on this project which, which was called Home and Other Stories. And it was a, a way for me to think and look at the ways in which people's homes were reflections of, of who they are and who we are as a culture. But I didn't want to have just a very traditional photographic show. And I really wanted to start thinking about ways in which to expand viewing photographs. So in this situation, I, I, cut, um, uh, I, cut, lay, I cut tape, blackout tape around the lights in the exhibition and so the only thing that were that was illuminated were these triptychs, these long triptychs, um, about six feet long, and and then the gallery was painted these various kind of domestic colors that you might see in, in living rooms. And what happened when you walked in the gallery, it gave you this sense of like that you were looking through windows or you were looking at television sets, and it provided a sense of intimacy for people to kind of move into the artwork and begin to create their own narrative because each triptych was in fact one person's home. So that got me thinking about different ways of different modalities and ways of, of viewing photographs. And just here's a close up. So the, the, the images themselves were three panels. So this would be panel one, panel two, panel three. And that's how you would read it. And I believe really we're all storytellers. So it, it, that, 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 um, that intervention of lighting the galleries in that way allowed people to have this sense of intimacy, walk up to the artwork and start reading and start creating and reading their own story. 
And the, the method I used in terms of photographing homes, I would ask the security guard at a museum or I'd ask some a friend's neighbor. So I didn't want to know who the people were. So it would allow me to also become a storyteller and create my own story. So in this image, I walked into, I was uh, invited to photograph at this person's house. And I knew that all I knew was that um, they had they had children and that he was a psychiatrist. And I walked into this bedroom and I thought, oh my God, they have 12 children. And on closer inspection, I realized, no, they don't have 12 children. They had this beautiful homage of, of the chronology of their kids growing up. And so I kind of played with that in this kind of lyrical way where I then photographed the wallpaper from the bathroom and it takes on a very similar kind of structure but completely different kinds of information. Um, that exhibition from LACMA then went on to the Mills College Art Museum. And I, did, I had made this decision that in order for me as an artist to continue to rethink bodies of work that I, I asked the museums who have invited me, may I change the way I install the work so it, it allows me to have different facets of interpreting it. So this was the same show that you just saw at LACMA, now at the Mills College Art Museum. And there I worked with a wonderful architectural team um, by the name of IOOA, their Interim Office of Architecture, um, Bruce Tom and... Uh, um, so, what we did is we, Bruce Tom and John Randolph, thank you. So what we did is we interviewed the person's job who used to name the colors for the Fuller O'Brien Paint Company. And we all, I, I've been intrigued for years on a language level of when you walk into a paint store or a hardware store and there are those paint chips, I would always look at those colors and then be fascinated with like, how are these colors named? Why do we call this Rose's Wisp? Or why do we call this fleeting blue. And I thought, what an interesting job. So we, we interviewed the man who had that job for many years. And um, it was just, it was fascinating to, to find out like, you know, he wasn't a poet, he wasn't an English major, but he would make up these titles. And I thought it was, I thought it was really an amazing position. And what I did here in terms of like how to look at artwork, I reversed the gesture so that um, you're used to reading close up and you're used to um, uh, looking at artwork farther away. So I reversed the gesture and I made these kind of architectural interventions where the text from um, one of the authors of the book became column-like and you would stand far away from it to be able to read, to read excerpts from the essay. And then you would move forward in order to read the triptychs. And I painted the gallery 26 different colors um, 26 different colors from, from that Fuller O'Brien's new, new domestic colors. And the essays were, um, were written by an author, a wonderful author in the Bay Area by the name of Anne Lamont. And she had seen my work home and other stories and, and said, this is so much about what I'm writing, what I'm writing about. So she became the, um, the contributor, the creative contributor, creative writer to, the, um, to this exhibition. And then her work becomes very column-like in language on the walls. So this gives you a sense, again, of this kind of like sculptural intervention and with the use of just 26 different colors, uh, but, but already kind of challenging the way that we think about artwork in a white box or a museum. Uh, I, in, 19, um, in 1996, I had been in residence at, uh, I was the Chancellor Scholar at the Washington University in St. Louis. And I, I had started working on a project about the Human Genome Project and about, sci and about the ways in which that genetic science was changing the way that we live and both in terms of like the miracles and the madness of what, what genomics could do. So I, I didn't have a science background, but I was very interested in the ways in which science was contributing to the construction of culture. So, <clears throat> I was embedded in the seven, um, seven areas um, of the Human Genome Project, uh, MIT, Stanford University, Los Alamos, uh, Washington University, St. Louis, and several other sites. And I started kind of really kind of pulling apart this idea of like art and science investigating matter. And when I came to, um, to doing the exhibition at the museum in St. Louis, 
I decided to work with the, in, the installation again in this very architectural format. Um, again, um, looking at the ways in which science often kind of um, uh, parses things into very kind of a, mon a monocular vision of, of whatever, that, whatever that research is. So I worked with light boxes, which you often see in science labs, and I worked with a wonderful uh, two writers, one uh, um, philosopher of science, Helen Longino, and William Gass, a wonderful writer. And so I think language has always been an important part of my work. And these are pull quotes on these light boxes that had to do with the ideas I was thinking about as an artist when I was doing this work. And so you'll see this kind of like moving toward architecture as um, a really important part of, of, of the way I'm thinking about installation. And these kinds of questions, you know, if the central aim is to characterize the entire genome, and if everyone's genome is unique, whose genome will be characterized? Who will decide what gets to represent the human standard? Those were really kind of heady life death cycle questions that philosophically I was extremely interested in. Um, these, this, I had been reading Frankenstein's, Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, and had found these uh, apparatus at, at Stanford Linear Accelerator and added extra tin foil to the aluminum foil to these in order to kind of keep that heat in from the machine. But it became a very corporeal and Frankenstein-like presence. And I've been a big fan of, of the novel Frankenstein for years because I think it was so ahead of its time. And I think Frankenstein was such a misunderstood creature. There's a series of still lifes in art and science investigating matter. And again, thinking about text, how does text work with imagery? I was very intrigued with these bottles when this emphasis on definitely not sterile. Or something as simple as this, it's called sequential molecules. It's a typology of nine photographs that uh, each represent a different area of science, anything from the most recent information or research on how to build a better airplane wing to the most cutting edge research at that time on most recent pharmacology for um, uh, research on AIDS. And the, the way that this installation is set up is I, I have this long view of this nine part typology of these fossils talking about ideas of like, well, wh from where do we come? And then looking the other way of this um, 12 part typology of the interior of 80 minus 86 degree freezers. And you're now you're looking at the archives of science. You're looking at the, the piece is called 12 areas of concern and crisis. And you're looking at the, 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 the research from breast cancer, AIDS, alcoholism, um, uh, multiple sclerosis, and I just think to myself now, this piece, the, the name 12 Areas of Concern and Crisis, and so much about the minus 86 degree freezers, there's something very topical about this piece in terms of what we're dealing with now, in terms of the, the vaccination being needed to be in these kind of very, very minus 86 degree, very cold freezers. That piece um, then became uh, the catalyst to do a, a public project, and these are if you will, the portraits of those freezers. And I, I call them portraits because in many ways they're very portrait-like. They're, they're revealing, There's, they're revealing about human culture. You would think that something like the Human Genome Project is like so exact. And, and yet there's something about the way that all of these, this is a freezer that holds the research from HIV. Uh, so these freezers and that piece became, um, became a, a new sculptural piece for Comme des Garçons in Kyoto, Japan. And Comme des Garçons has long worked with artists. Um, they're a very high-end fashion um, designer, Rei Kawakubo. And she's long worked with artists in the design of her stores. And she saw some of these freezers at a collector's house in London. And she thought, this is exactly what I'm trying to work with. So we worked together to design what I call a new skin, a skin for this store. And that's what really made me start thinking about bringing my work outside of the museum and gallery existence. So here you are in this high fashion store and I've created these 18 foot walls that are laminated onto stainless steel. And there's not 
that it's just completely obsessive. Wherever you look, you're confronted with the portrait of these of these minus 86 degree freezers, and thus you're confronted with um, this whole notion of, of of genetic science and the way the ways in which our culture is being um, uh, our culture, the contributions of, of genetic science to our culture. So I thought this was such an interesting intervention in terms of like high fashion and very conceptual art. Even when you go into the dressing room and you're trying on an outfit and you're looking at yourself in the mirror, the background will always have you superimposed over these minus 86 degree freezers. In, um, in 2000, um, I think in the late 1999 or 2000, I was awarded a fellowship by the San Jose Museum of Art. And it was in the height of one of the first technology gold rushes at that point. And they said, you know, given where we are in the Silicon Valley, we should award an artist who's never worked with technology. We should award an artist a, uh, a fellowship to, to work with technology, but not somebody who spent a time with technology. And I was awarded this fellowship, and I asked that I that I, I proposed that I would work with molec uh, with um with medical imaging devices, not as a scientist. Obviously, I'm not a scientist. I'm not trying to document science. I'm an artist. But I was wondering, with the same tools that these scientists had, what 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 could I do with these tools in terms of um, making artwork? And the first thing I did is I brought, I thought, I think I'm gonna image these, I think I'm gonna work with the MRI and the SEM, which allow you to see on a molecular level. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna bring these fruits. And I thought, I'm gonna do this project where I'm looking at the interiors of these, the seven fruits from the Bible. And I'm working at Stanford University at that time. And I bring in this, this box full of fruits and I bring in a, a knife thinking that I'm gonna cut them. And the people who were there to facilitate me were like, oh, no, 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 Miss Wagner, are you unclear on the concept? You don't cut any of these things. It's the machine, the MRI, the magnetic resonance imaging that, that allows you to, to be able to kind of slice through and create cross sections and in a non-invasive way. So I thought that was so interesting how naive I was in terms of how this worked. And one of the first images I, I made was of the interior of this pomegranate. And I recognized, oh my God, these are so beautiful. It looks so cellular or so of the body, this very corporeal presence. And I, I made these very long, uh, very large hanging scrolls of, of the interior of the pomegranate, which were hanging in my studio. And every time somebody came in, they said, are those human cells? So that prompted me to, to make this piece called Pomegranate Wall, which is, I think, eight feet high by 40 feet long. And it, it's, it's in a curved arc, and it can be fit site specifically to, um, to the architecture of the room. But I, I've designed it so that it will always be a curve. And some very interesting things happen that a lot of these museum floors are very kind of high polished terrazzo. And what happened is the, the pomegranate wall sculpture is standing and yet it cast a clone of itself kind of mirroring onto the floor. And I thought that was another kind of a really salient part of this piece because I was really thinking of all the ramifications and implications of science on culture. And cloning was something that I was really, really kind of struggling with. I then decided let's let's move let's move outside and let's move and start working with these civic structures. And I was awarded the um, commission to work with the Los Angeles Police Department downtown. And I thought, oh my God, I can't imagine a more contentious site. Um, and uh, as you know, downtown LA, there are a whole group of, of really lovely warehouses and, and condominiums that um, encircle that park where the LA Times newspaper building was uh, and across the street from that Morphosis project also. And many of those people had moved into those condos and warehouses there, knowing that there would be this public park and that they would have access to this outside space. Well, the LAPD ended up moving their new auditorium and their new headquarters to this park. And so there was a, a, a real dance in terms of like, how do you allow community to share this park with the LAPD? And I thought that was, I thought, you know, it was a contentious situation in terms of like, 
who gets to occupy this, this, this piece of landscape or this piece of greenscape in downtown LA. And it ended up working well because the park is so well designed that it is really, it is very inviting to the public. So I started thinking about, well, what am I going to do? And I, and I thought I was very intrigued with this, this large auditorium, which is a civic auditorium and part of the LAPD, but also can be used by the community. And I, and I took this tour. I took a tour. I hired this historian. And I took a tour um, all throughout downtown LA to really kind of understand the history of it. And there was a Noguchi, there's a Noguchi's first commission. There's a Noguchi Plaza right near a theater, right in Japantown in downtown LA. And there was these beautiful, or I shouldn't say beautiful, but to me, they were beautiful because of their perseverance, a grapefruit tree and an orange tree. And they were apparently incredibly old, like hundreds of years old. And they looked mangled and they didn't look healthy, but they, they persevered in that they continued to, to bear fruit. And I, that became the catalyst for what I wanted to do. And so I decided that I would make this piece called Ghost Grove about the verdant um, citrus groves that once occupied all of downtown Los Angeles. So I set about um, uh, photographing a large scale with eight by 10 view camera in Ojai, California, the, the citrus groves of, of Ojai, California, and then made this 160 foot file of, of these orange groves uh, because that's what that's what that area was in downtown LA, and laser etched those onto these aluminum panels that circ they, that circumnavigate that auditorium. So wherever you see the orange there, that is uh, that's in the LAPD, and then in the auditorium, that those, those aluminum panels circumnavigate that building with this piece entitled Ghost Grove, and then those orange um, those orange discs you see are cut mylar cut mylar uh, orange discs that when the sun hits it, it projects onto the wall. It projects onto the wall that you see here. And it looks like this kind of, you know, um, uh, low tech animation of oranges falling. So I really, I, I really embraced this notion of, of the landscape of what was there. And um, so this is this piece called Ghost Grove. Um, another piece that's still in process, I was working in um, Seattle and I was invited to do uh, a piece under this major thoroughfare on Mercer, which is the real entrance to Seattle. And that little red circle you see there, that's the overpass that I, I was going to work in. And that's, became, um, that's become a pedestrian, bicyclists and six lane freeway into downtown Seattle. And as I was spending time doing research there, I was in the hotel room and one day the, the, the Seattle rain is famous for like its abundance. And I was in the hotel room and I was just kind of photographing with the iPhone outside, the, outside of the um, hotel room because the wind was so high and the rain was so strong that at one point the rain became absolutely horizontal. And so it was, I called, I said, oh my God, I'm, I'm sitting in this hotel and there's this atmospheric flurry. And that became the title for the piece that's in process now. And so what I decided to do was um, when I was looking at these, this rain that had, had become horizontal, it actually looked like they were, they were creating these moire patterns. And I thought, since there's a 16 foot sidewalk which will be uh, for pedestrians and bicyclists, wouldn't it be interesting to, again, instead of to have this like low tech animation. So I started studying moire patterns and um, worked with an algorithmic designer to create these moire patterns so that if you're walking, you're on a bicycle, these, these moire patterns become very animated and really quite beautiful. Um, they've run into so some issues on, on site. So those are still not installed. Uh, but will be, I think, in about a, six months to a year. Um, another project I worked on for the city of Santa Monica, again, in Southern California, they were building this site called, um, I think at that point it was called The Village. They've since changed it to um, the, the, the Ocean or something like that. But we, we attended a lot of community meetings because they were building a very kind of, a very interesting um, site where there was going to be retail, some bookstores, some restaurants, 
uh, very high-end luxury housing, which would have views of the Santa Monica Bay and the ocean. And then there would be some studios at, um, you know, uh, uh, at both market rate and subsidized. So it was going to be this, this experiment, if you will, and they wanted it based on the living streets that all of this, it's a, it's a large site and that you could walk throughout this whole compound, you could eat, you could find a, go to restaurants, you could find bookstores, you could go to an artist studio. And there would be, you know, these three different kind of domestic structures. And I thought to myself after attending these meetings and asking everybody, what, why, why do you live here? Why do you live in Santa Monica? And 90% of the people all said, I live in Santa Monica because of its proximity to the ocean. I want to be near the ocean. And I thought, okay, that's, that's, that's the, the guiding force behind the idea I want to work with. But then I thought, how many people actually get access to that view? And really only the, the very kind of high luxury housing had access to that view. So it got me thinking about how do I bring the ocean to the living streets within, which, within this, uh, the village, if you will. And we found out that the um, um, national oceanic atmospheric government run buoys are all throughout the Santa Monica Bay, and it's giving a constant readout in terms of like what the weather's like and what's happening with the wave action in the bay. And, and in that readout, we, we could tap into it through technology. And I designed this 36 foot ellipse uh, where under a sky bridge, so you're walking in or out of that site. I put a, a thermal camera up into the sky bridge so that when you're walking in or out, it's recording the heat coming from your body or a dog or a group of people. And now the patterns are constantly changing by virtue of you walking underneath it, as well as what's happening atmospherically out in the bay. So what you're seeing right now is you're seeing the kind of squiggly lines are that group of people that are looking up at the, at the ellipse. And then the other pattern you're seeing is the more consistent pattern of the landscape of what's happening in the Santa Monica Bay in the weather. So if nobody's under there, you're just, you're just getting a readout of whatever the atmospheric action of the bay is, is happening. So here's one person walking through. So it really gave this sense of like, of people being part of that ocean landscape. And it's been very successful, I was told, so successful that they now have to turn it off at 10 o'clock at night because people from the park next door like to come and do snow angels and have a little cocktail. And so it's, they now turn it off at 10 o'clock at night. But it is a way, of, I thought it was a way of really kind of sharing that, that ocean, if you will, with, um, with a lot more people. That project made me think about um, the, the access to the ocean, I, I had in my mind in one of my first proposals, what if we were to make periscopes on all the buildings so everybody would have access to see that ocean? Um, and so that notion of the, of the periscope was, was embedded in my mind for years before I did this project at, uh, at the Mills College Art Museum. And in the Mills College Art Museum, it's an ex extremely old structure. And I was able to go up into the attic, if you will, where the skylight is, and there's these catwalks. And I was, I, I love engineering, I love structure, I love architecture, I love all the ways these intricacies form this kind of, you know, what is seemingly this visual cacophony becomes actually very kind of this beautiful and, and, and meditative um, structure. So I, I did this intervention up there where I placed um, a red, blue, and green um, resin, uh, resin panels there. And nobody will ever see it. I mean, only if you have access to be up in that attic and you don't. So I thought how, I, and I thought this was a really kind of a beautiful installation. And so I thought, what can I do to bring it to other people? So I started over the period of several years, started doing these interventions into the Mills College art museum, every time they would take down a show, I might cut into the walls before something else is open and do another intervention. And when I finally got permission to, to do this exhibition, which is called Archaeology in Reverse, I started thinking of that the inside of the museum would become, um, would become a camera, would become this like, and the, this, the, the, the interior, and I would cut apertures into the sides of the wall to frame these different points of view on different landscapes. As, an, as I started kind of opening up 
existing walls that had um, been been sheetrocked over for many years, the kinds of information that that was delivered to me in terms of like these hidden secrets was phenomenal. And so this became a, um, a 10 foot by a uh, six foot photograph, kind of larger than life. And it just, it, again, it has that same kind of, that same kind of pull for me of, of the ways in which I think about connections and architecture and structure. Uh, this is also um, a very large photograph of the installation I did above the skylight. And that's when you walked in the exhibition. And I think that photograph is also at least, I think 12 feet by eight feet. Um, and then you see that blue square up there. There I kind of, I figured out where we were, where that museum was exactly on Google Maps. And I created a map, a specific map. And when the light comes down, it would project down into that square. I was really interested in, in having access for, or the viewers from the gallery of having access to look at the installation I did above, above the skylight. And I started thinking about the drawings I had done, the original drawings I had done for the village at Santa Monica with the periscope idea that never came to fruition. And I, I collaborated with this absolutely wonderful architectural team by the name of Nicholas de Monchot and Catherine de Monchot. And I met both of them when we were both Rome Prize Fellows in, at the American Academy in Rome. And we immediately took a liking to one another's work and just the dialogue that, um, that came together. And it turned out that Nicholas was an architecture professor at University of California. No longer, he's moved on to become the chairman of the architecture department at MIT. So we worked one summer um, on this installation and he created these wonderful periscopes to solve that problem of like, how do people see the installation or how do people see that, that area above the skylight that I found so fascinating. So here's a long view. And then these are these, um, these are these, if you notice these little triangular boxes on the floor, they have a mirror on top. So you kind of, you, you look down onto the mirror and the mirror is, is basically giving you this abstraction of whatever I've done with the, um, with the installation above. And here you're literally looking up through the interior of, a, of, of one of the periscopes. And they were, it was like that same thing when you're a kid and you're looking through one of these kaleidoscopes. It was just this kind of magic world and the, the notion of the periscope still continues to intrigue me. And these are some of the apertures that are, I cut into the side of the museum building. And basically they become kind of a framework, if you will, for a framing of the landscape and beyond. And I use this scrim so that you're always able to see through the notion of transparency becomes really important. And the color blue is omnipresent throughout the exhibition. I chose the color blue because it has to do with these ideas of knowledge. So here's another one of these apertures and you're looking out into the landscape and there's a blue, um, a blue uh, acrylic panel there that actually frames that part of the landscape. So in many ways, these, these become apertures or in, in the same way of like a camera. And this just gives you a sense of scale. One of the um, uh, museum staff looking at this piece. So you can see how scale became really important in negotiating this space. And that wonderful moray pattern that comes through the scrim, that's morays seem to have been become a large part of a lot of my research and development for a lot of projects that I'm working on. And I thought I'd end with what I'm currently working on now. Um, because I was asked to talk about you know, what, what I do outside of just the gallery and the museum. I'm working on a new project for the Tampa, um, Tampa New Wing for the Tampa International Airport. And it's a very, um, it's 32 feet high. It involves um, viewing points from several different levels. So here you're on the top level and you're looking at it. Here you're seeing only a part of it. Here you're on the bottom looking at part of it. And so there are these multiple perspectives that um, I had to I had to work on a piece that would allow me to uh, to have, to be able to command a wall that would have multiple perspectives. And there used to be a very famous modernist garden right in front of this wall um, outside. 
and they had to take that they took that garden away in order to uh, in order to build this new international wing for the airport. And so I started thinking about the indigenous plants from from Tampa and from Florida. So the piece is is really a collage or an amalgam, if you will, of laser etched um, uh, indigenous kind of tropical plants from that area. And then these voids, you'll see these voids that are cut in. And so it creates this undulating, and I didn't want to work with a rectangle. I wanted to work with this kind of undulating shape. Um, so it becomes this very sculptural, photographic, um, two-dimensional, still two-dimensional piece with the illusion of it being 3D from its multiple perspectives. So that's something that's just in process now. And when I'm in process with something, we're, we're literally just beginning to etch and, and learn how the, the, these patterns are are, are transferring to the color. There's a lot of R&D. I always have to kind of go through a process of how to mix the color the way I want it. I have to uh, contract with anodizers. I have to contract with a lot of different kinds of fabricators. So that, that kind of is, brings you up to what I'm working on now. And I'm getting ready for uh, a very interesting show called Clues to Our Civilization. And Clues to Our Civilization is a, uh, an exhibition which will be here in San Francisco at Jessica Silverman's new gallery in Chinatown. And it'll open, I think, mid-July. And it will have four or five different bodies of work, um, some that have never been seen in San Francisco, but seen elsewhere. And there will be basically a kind of a re-envisioning a re and recontextualization of a lot of work that people may know, but seen in this new context. So I'm, I'm very excited about about that as well. I want to thank you, um, Francesca, for inviting me and, and giving me this opportunity to uh, share this work with people. Thank you so much, Catherine. You are wonderful. Local Voices launching next Monday. Please find Catherine Wagner's episode and the rest of our series as we release new episodes every Monday through June. You can check us out on our website, deyoung.famsf.org backslash Local Voices Season 3. So excited to say that our museums are now open. Calder and Picasso is now on view at the De Young Museum. We recommend booking your tickets in advance online at tickets.famsf.org. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. We will see you next week.